So show them. The slides are up. You have the floor, sir. Great, thank you very much. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, um, Associate Director and a Senior Scientist here at the Planetary Science Institute, I lead up the Colorado office uh, for uh, PSI. Uh, we're headquartered out of Tucson, Arizona. Um, in addition, I serve as the US and the Deputy Team Leader for SHARAD, um, that's the shallow radar on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about a project um, that I've been involved with, um, with fellow PSI scientist Gareth Morgan and a bunch of other folks um, called the Mars Subsurface Water Ice Mapping Project. Um, our latest phase of this project is uh, very much aimed at uh, trying to uh, support development and planning work for the International Mars Ice Mapper concept, um, which is a, a big international effort uh, that aims to pro produce a very careful mapping of shallow surface subsurface ice on Mars as a resource to be used by future human missions. Um, so the SWIM team's been around for quite a few years now. Um, we first formed in uh, late 2017, um, and um, we've kind of grown um, and, and shrunk a little over the years as the project has evolved. Um, all of the folks on this slide have been involved at one point or another with the SWIM team participating in various aspects of the study, um, shown here different groups um, on different parts of the effort, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so as an overview, um, we've known for decades now that there are multiple lines of evidence that support the presence of this subsurface ice um, in nonpolar regions across the mid-latitudes of Mars. Um, for example, the neutron spectrometer on the Mars Odyssey spacecraft has detected hydrogen in the high latitudes in both hemispheres at levels that uh, is very suggestive of the presence of uh, ice within the upper meter or so. Um, in addition, thermal studies uh, using uh, spectrometers um, have uh, uh, that measure the temperature of the surface have been used to infer the presence of an ice table uh, down to latitudes of about 50 degrees in both hemispheres. Um, in addition, the cameras on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, both the, the context camera, CTX, and the high resolution camera, high rise, uh, have identified ice exposing impacts at the surface. So these are occurring during the course of the mission. Um, and these uh, leave a bright material on the surface um, and some uh, use of a spectrometer also established that those are definitely water ice deposits. Um, so this is very clear evidence of water ice in these at, at these specific locations. Um, in addition, uh, imagery can be used to uh, examine geomorphic features, such as these uh, glacial-like forms around this high standing um, uh, peak here in this view from um, the uh, taken from the Holt et al. paper um, that I, that studies these glacial deposits. Um, so um, most most of the studies up until the SWIM project came along really focused on either an isolated region, or one data set, maybe uh, globally. Um, but the uh, SWIM project really is the first one to integrate all of these different data sets together and with a focus on finding that ice as a resource, as opposed to, you know, trying to understand it uh, from a scientific standpoint. Um, in particular, uh, NASA's uh, motivation for this ISRU, or in-situ resource utilization uh, driven project, is to provide maps that will support both the community assessment of future human landing sites, and um, measurement or targeting uh, prioritizations 
for future missions like the International um, Mars Ice Mapper. Um, so as I uh, mentioned previously, we use a number of different techniques uh, to get at where this ice is. Um, this includes the, those neutron spectrometers, uh, thermal spectrometers, um, as well as geomorphic mapping from imagery and elevation data. Um, and then the radar, um, we actually use two aspects of the radar from the uh, shallow radar sounder. One is to understand the, the surface response of, of the radar, which actually informs you down several meters into the subsurface. Um, and then we also look for discrete reflections off of interfaces associated with ice um, with that same radar instrument. Um, so for each of these five techniques, we isolate some distinct property that they measure uh, to provide a proxy for the presence or the absence of buried water ice. Um, we call this uh, ice consistency. Um, and we set this measurement, uh, those measurement values to correspond to ranges in ice consistency that run from minus one, meaning wholly inconsistent with the presence of ice, to plus one, which means wholly consistent with the presence of ice. Of course, some of the measurements give you um, information that is isn't not an absolute certainty of whether there's ice or not. And so the ice consistency can take values anywhere in that range. Um, so this table, uh, which I won't go through in a lot of detail, um, is basically showing how we map the measured property from the instrument or technique to the ice consistency. So just as an example, in this first um, row for the neutron spectrometers, which only sense in the upper meter or so, um, the measurement that we get uh, from the, the data set is the water equivalent hydrogen in a the lower of two modeled layers. Um, and when the, the um, the amount of that uh, water equivalent hydrogen is greater than 10% uh, of the material, um, then that's a pretty good indication that you're probably in the realm of buried ice as opposed to, say, hydrated minerals. Um, and so we set the range to be um, uh, positive values between above 10% um, water equivalent hydrogen. Um, so we do similar that mappings of the data from uh, the, the thermal method, uh, as well as the radar methods and the geomorphology. Um, in some instances, the, we see the full range from minus one to plus one. In others, we can't really infer a, a negative um, detection. Um, and so we only have the positive side of the range for the thermal and the geomorphic techniques. Um, because each of these techniques senses to a different sensing depth, um, we can take advantage of that fact um, to kind of assess uh, the depth range uh, for the, the ice consistency. Um, so we break out the ice consistency values into three depth ranges in particular, uh, from zero to one meter depth, one to five meter depth, and then greater than five meters. Um, so because each of the terms, now here we see the these ice consistency values C, um, where the subscripts indicate the, the technique, so N for neutrons, T for the thermal spectrometer data, um, RS for the radar surface return, RD for the deeper radar reflections, um, and then G for the geomorphic terms. Um, in our or the first phase of our study, uh, we simply averaged all of these terms together and divided by the number of terms to get an average ice consistency. Um, but more recently, we've adopted a, 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 a new technique where we apply different weightings. Um, and in particular, we can apply different weightings to different depth zones, uh, given the different sensing depths of the instruments. Um, so for uh, for the second equation, then each of those C terms has a weighting term specific to the, the technique. So it also has the same subscript 
um, for the waiting term S. Um, and then we divide by um, the sum of the waiting terms as opposed to uh, just the number of techniques. Um, now the weightings um, are determined by something we call the shallowness of the method. Um, so that's the depth of the interest, uh, the depth of interest that you're trying to examine divided by the depth of penetration of that technique. So for example, um, with the neutron spectrometer, which only sees the upper meter, if the, the zone of interest is, is that upper meter, then the weighting term is one. Um, but if you, uh, if your um, depth zone of interest is uh, greater than one, then the weighting term actually goes to zero because the neutron spectrometer is not telling you about uh, data in that, um, it's not giving you any information about whether ice is present or absent in that zone. Um, uh, so similarly, the other terms have different weightings um, across the different depth zones. Um, so using these uh, technique specific uh, methods and these different depth zones, we um, we come up with, um, well, first I'll take you through the, um, the ice consistency from each of the methods. Um, so here's a, a neutron um, uh, derived ice consistency. Um, so this is a glow, uh, generally uh, the, the mapping um, is quasi-global in that um, NASA restricted us to uh, examining the uh, mid-latitudes between plus and minus 60 degrees of latitude um, and to elevations below plus one kilometer above the Martian datum. Um, this is because um, those very high latitudes in either hemisphere and the very high elevations are not particularly accessible uh, for the first uh, human landings um, due to thermal constraints um, as well as the, you know, the thickness of the atmosphere that um, they need to slow down in as they're coming into land. Um, so they asked us not to spend our time uh, examining those areas. Uh, so they're kind of blacked out here on the map. Um, but so this is the uh, consistency for that neutron technique uh, where we took the hydrogen content uh, measure uh, and used it to determine ice consistency. Um, so where the deep blue values are, these are very highly consistent with the presence of ice uh, as determined by a neutron spectrometer. And not surprisingly, this is limited to the higher um, latitudes uh, where that instrument was able to detect that shallow ice. Um, there are some, uh, you know, uh, small positive uh, detections in the um, in the mid latitude or the equatorial zone, uh, such as pointed out here in the center of the map, um, we believe these uh, are possibly due to just an elevated uh, hydrated mineral uh, presence um, in these areas, rather than um, truly equatorial ice. Um, so for the thermal technique. Uh, again, this only senses in the upper meter or so. Um, this uh, result from that method um, extends down a little closer to the equator, but still uh, mostly above, say, uh, 40 to 45 degrees, uh, though it varies um, substantially across different longitudes. Um, uh, so these, these two techniques give us a couple of different ways of trying to find ice within that upper meter of the subsurface. Um, one um, uh, caveat with a the thermal method is the th thermal method can't really distinguish between a, a buried um, layer of bedrock versus a buried layer of, of ice or ice cemented soil. Um, and so some false positives may result. Um, this is why we use multiple techniques is because some of them have false positives or false negatives, and we want to use the techniques all together to try to rule those in or out. 
Uh, so moving on to the radar surface technique. Um, in this case, the radar, um, the surface return from the radar is gives a, us information about the upper five meters of the subsurface. Um, and in, in particular, it gives us information about the density of the materials. So ice tends to be of lower density than rock and uh, soil. Um, and so a positive uh, consistency is where we see lower densities with this method. Um, however, this also has uh, um, a potential for false positives in that dust, um, and in fact, thicker you know, layers of dust uh, may also yield a, a lower density in that upper layer. And then um, in, in this mapping, it would show up as a, a blue pixel um, and therefore false positive, because if it's dust, just you know, dry dust, um, then the, there's no actual ice there. Um, so the radar, uh, the deeper sounding radar method, where we're actually looking for discrete reflections from interfaces in the subsurface, is more limited geographically, uh, although it does occur in some broad regions, in the, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, also, um, in uh, areas that are containing glacial-like landforms, uh, we see strong uh, radar reflections. Um, and in many instances, we're able to constrain the, the depth of that those um, reflections um, and get us at the dielectric properties, which then inform us whether they're consistent or inconsistent with ice. Um, in, in many cases, um, in these terrains, um, we see very consistent ice-like dielectric properties um, and um, the uh, so the um, the radar subsurface return now is telling us that this deeper buried ice um, down at uh, tens or even up to hundreds of meters depth. Um, so the last of the, the techniques is the geomorphic mapping. Um, this is a, a little less quantitative, um, but we can infer uh, something about ice depths from the, the nature and the scale of the geomorphic features, such as whether they're polygons or large-scale uh, glacial-like landforms, for example. Um, and so then this map shows the, um, the, uh, the pixels where we see um, one or more of these glacial-like landforms um, that are uh, believed to be associated with buried water ice. Um, so to give you an idea about that, here's a kind of a, a gallery of different landforms um, that we map uh, as part of the SWIM project. Um, these are um, all thought to be uh, paraglacial landforms of one sort or another. Um, we actually weight them a little differently depending on the landform because some are, um, there's much higher likelihood that they contain current day ice um, whereas some others, um, uh, such as these um, uh, ring mole craters, um, are less le um, certain to contain ice in the present day. They may be a, a vestige of, of past ice. Um, so one thing that we noticed when looking at these ice exposing impacts that I mentioned earlier um, was that they uh, tend to occur where um, there are uh, these uh, smaller scale polygons, uh, like you see in this high rise image here uh, with the exposed ice and has these bright bluish pixels around this small crater. Um, and, and then these polygons um, that surround, surround the, the crater and uh, outlying areas um, with boulders on top of them. Um, these occur almost in every case where we find these ice exposing impacts. Um, so it occurred to us then that we could use these polygons as a proxy uh, for very high confident uh, ice detections. Um, so our latest phase of mapping has uh, brought this uh, uh, landform and the, and the high rise, the use of the high rise imagery in, into the mapping process. 
Okay, so once we have all these maps from each of the different techniques, then as I alluded to earlier, we need to kind of add them all together to come up with those composite ice consistencies. Um, and when we do that, applying that equation um, for that shallowest layer, zero to one meter, um, we get this map. So this is a composite ice consistency um, where we have uh, some the cons consistencies uh, in some cases weighted um, for the different techniques um, and divided by the, the sum of the weights. Um, and we're, we also apply a threshold um, to uh, help us focus on areas of higher confidence for the presence of that buried ice. Um, so in this uh, instance, the threshold is set to about 0.3. Um, this is uh, and a, a kind of an equivalent value where, um, for example, you might have one term that has an ice consistency of one, so it's fully consistent with ice, while the other terms are zero. They don't say one way or another way whether there might be ice. That would come out to a value of 0.3 in this um, equation. Um, and so we use that as kind of our cutoff of, to um, filter out those very low confidence areas of ice. Uh, similarly, we can produce a, a map uh, for near surface ice consistency in the next zone down one to five meters depth. Um, uh, we drop a term here um, or, and are down to uh, three terms in the in the equation um, with slightly different weightings. Um, and the the extent of the ice uh, extends a little closer to the equator. So we're now down in the high 20s to mid or low 30s. Uh, as the uh, extent of where that um, uh, ice extends down toward the equator. Uh, finally, um, we uh, look at that deeper ice, um, and this uh, is informed both by the geomorphic mapping and the radar uh, deeper sensing. Um, of course, when we apply the threshold, we kind of uh, filter out a lot of the geomorphic mapping. Um, and are left mostly with the terrains that um, we get the nice detections in there in the deeper radar. Um, so um, then once and another uh, thing that we can do once we have these three different depth zones is sort of combine them all, all back together uh, and give us a, a composite view of where ice is without a, a you know specific uh, indicator of depth. Um, and we, in this instance, we do that by a simple averaging of those three um, depth specific uh, maps um, across those zones. Um, so this is sort of the all over composite ice consistency map. Um, it gives you a good feel for where the, um, the higher consistencies are with these deeper blue shades, um, lower consistencies with the light blue shades. Um, and even a few pixels um, teasing us down in the mid latitudes. Again, these might be um, debris covered glacier, or I'm sorry, th these might be um, uh, hydrated mineral um, hot, high values kind of leaking through uh, from the uh, mostly from the neutron spectrometer mapping. Um, so again, these uh, ice exposing impacts. Um, in the uh, scheme for the, the swim project, these really serve as our ground truth because when when uh, impact hits and the ice is exposed, then, the, then you know for certain really that you have an ice detection um, at that location. Um, and so we then over plot these on our, our uh, mapping results, um, kind of as a sanity check to see whether the methods that we use align with where the kind of quasi-random um, exposures of ice from the impacts are, are confirming the presence of that ice. Now, the vast majority of these uh, recent impacts are small, um, and they only expose materials down um, within the upper meter or so of the subsurface. So in this case, we're comparing the locations um, in these uh, green and uh, orange dots of, of clear detections or possible detections of ice 
uh, against the um, zero to one layer, um, the swim result. Um, and you see a really nice correspondence where um, the occurrence of these ice detections in, in these uh, colored dots is occurring. Um, and the, uh, the, the uh, darker blue pixels are occurring on, on our mapping result. Um, I should note that we also have marked here locations of non-ice exposing recent impacts with red Xs. Uh, many of these occur in these gray zones with low uh, ice consistency. Um, however, there are some in the higher ice consistency zones, but an important caveat here is um, an ice detection uh, requires that you image it um, within a certain time frame. Um, so if the imaging of the new impact uh, is delayed for whatever reason, uh, it's possible that it did expose ice and that ice has sublimated before uh, we were able to come back around with the high rise camera and take an image of that fresh impact. Um, so um, one um, important um, uh, thing I should point out is in the re uh, recent, um, well, a little about a year, year ago, um, there was a, a big report about a much bigger impact that occurred. Um, that's over here in this region. Um, and it, it actually exposed ice down as deep as 10 meters. This was a big 150 meter diameter impact. Uh, was actually detected by the uh, seismometer on the InSight um, lander um, many thousands of kilometers away. Um, and they were able to locate it um, and image that and see the exposed ice. Um, so that one actually occurs down here on the edge of our map. Um, and it's well within the uh, mapping of the deeper ices um, from our, our uh, other two um, depth zones. Anyway, so I'll uh, sum up there and open the floor for questions. Um, I just wanted to present this uh, information about our publications. Um, so there's a relatively recent uh, paper in Nature Astronomy describing the results from the first phase of the SWIM project. Um, and then we have a book chapter um, in the Handbook of Space Resources that was published recently. Um, describing the later uh, phase uh, work from the SWIM project that extended things down into the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and we're kind of wrapping up this final uh, or third phase of SWIM um, and uh, producing um, refined products. Um, but everything that's been published so far is currently available on our website. Uh, so this includes binaries as well as uh, images of the, the mapping results. Um, and so you can you can pull down these binaries and load them up into your favorite mapping tool. Um, maybe even go in and apply your own weights if you don't like the ones we chose um, for our uh, composite mapping of the ice consistency. Anyway, um, we're excited to um, be part of this effort to support uh, future human exploration of Mars uh, by identifying where this ice is for uh, uh, future use as a resource at the surface, um, and also to inform efforts that will kind of close the gap that is left by some of these techniques that we're using here. Um, I should mention that you know, none of the methods, none of the instruments or the methods that um, have been used to date were really designed to look for this ice in this uh, shallow depth zone. Um, so we're kind of um, doing the best we can with the data sets that we have, and then using that to inform what to do next, say, with a synthetic aperture radar on the International Mars Ice Mapper mission. So I'll stop there and open the floor to questions. Um, thank you very much. Wonderful talk, thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Where would you say for a human mission to Mars, where is the best place to land to access the best amount of ice that you have found? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, and it's a, a difficult um, decision to try to make. Um, putting, setting aside the ice and the resource 
question for a moment. Um, when planning a, a next human, well, a first human uh, uh, mission to Mars, um, you you really want to aim to get as near the equator as you can because of the thermal um, conditions. You know, as the seasons change, um, you're you're kind of better off close to the equator, so you don't get too much fluctuation of the temperature. Um, and you know, in the winter months, um, it can get extremely cold. Um, if you go to high enough latitudes, uh, for example, the ice free or the the CO two freezes out onto the surface um, as low as you know forty five or fifty degrees latitude. So you want to try to keep it as close to the equator as you can. However, as you can see from the maps, um, the ice tends to be more and more um, concentrated and closer to the surface as you go further away from the equator. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a catch-22 here. Um, our, our recommendation is to look for the highest confident um, uh, ice from this mapping, um, as well as future efforts from the International uh, Mars Ice Mapper, should it go, go to Mars before a human mission, and, and pick an area where you can confidently say there is ice there in a quantity large enough that we can use it as a resource. Um, and one of the um, things I didn't really get into here is certain kinds of ice uh, features, we have a higher confidence that they are pure, more pure uh, water ice. So the, like those glacial landforms. So if you can land near one of these glacial landforms um, and maybe even have some of that that non-glacial ground ice under you or nearby, um, this would be a really great location to choose uh, for a first mission um, where you're wanting to use that ice as a resource. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we, we haven't, this project hasn't really zeroed in on specific landing sites. We were kind of asked not to do that. It's sort of a community effort is planned for that. Uh, with upcoming um, hu human landing site selection processes, um, uh, you know, um, but um, certainly you want, one could use these map and maps and other data to try to zero in on, on locations of that nature. Okay, great. Um, is there a delineation, a distinct boundary between the CO2 and H2O ice. So if a Martian astronaut was trying to, you know, get some ice to use for water, mm -hmm. is there a boundary? W would they be able to tell, you know, what's what when they go there? How would they do that? Sure. Um, so the, the ice that I've been talking about today, um, it's pretty widely held that all of this ice is water ice. Um, it's thought that uh, CO2 ice is not stable um, in, the, in the shallow subsurface at these latitudes. Um, there's there's been certainly been no definitive detection of CO2 ice off of the polar caps, apart from the seasonal comings and goings um, in the winter hemispheres. Um, you know, this, the CO2 ice does freeze out onto the surface every winter in both hemispheres, um, but in come springtime, all of that sublimates back up into the atmosphere. Um, there's also been no definitive detections of deposits of CO2 ice, even in the North Polar Cap area that survived the summer. Um, however, there are in the Southern um, Polar Cap. Um, and uh, um, so because the atmosphere is mostly made out of CO2, if you're worried about this problem on the ground, even, you know, maybe we haven't detected it, but perhaps it still exists somewhere in the mid-latitudes, the, the, the fact that the atmosphere is sort of buffers the, the, um, the CO2 ice at the surface, that means that the temperature is always going to be at the the CO2 sublimation pressure at that location, as long as there's CO2 ice there. Uh, so you can essentially use temperature as a determination of whether that is CO2 ice. Um, and it's very, very cold, like 100 and, um, 
50 or uh, lower uh, in Kelvin uh, for the um, the CO2 ice. Um, so that that basically would be your way to, to ensure that you know you're dealing with water ice and not CO2. Okay, thank you. Um, is it safe to drink if you're getting the ice and you're taking it, you know, to utilize for a mm -hmm. human mission? Sure. Is it safe to drink, and how would we make sure it's safe to drink? Great question. Um, there's a very good chance that would be very unsafe to drink. <laughs> Um, a, a lot of um, uh, salts um, have been detected at um, various landing sites. Um, in particular, perchlorate um, is known to exist at a number of different landing sites. Um, and even in low concentrations, um, these materials are, are quite poisonous uh, for humans. Um, so some sort of uh, to, to make the, the water produced from melting this ice uh, safe to drink, you, uh, certainly some sort of uh, distillation method that is able to um, remove all of that salt down to, you know, very minute levels is, is going to be absolutely necessary. Okay, and what is the best way, in your opinion, to get the ice to the humans, like, do they dig it out with a shovel? Do they have, you know, right. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, a good, great question. Um, and it, it's it's very dependent on how deep the overburden is. Um, so, um, for example, if that ice is just within the upper meter or so, then you know you could probably use sort of like a bulldozer to. To scrape off the, the debris cover um, and then just you know mine it out of the surface with the same bulldozer um, and then you know put it into a processing uh, facility that will you know melt say melt the water out of the rest of the debris um, and then you can send it on to a distillation facility if you're going to use it for drinking or uh, to some other processing if you're going to break it down and use it for fuel. Um, However, if it's quite a bit deeper, you know, say several meters to tens of meters, um, then you may want to switch over to a different technique, such as a, a drilling method, where you can drill down through the overburden into the ice body um, and impart heat to melt that ice in place in, in a liquid form and then pump it back up the drill stem. Um, so there's a project that NASA funded called Redwater, um, which has designed a prototype um, drill of this nature um, for use um, on Mars um, in instances where you have more than a, a couple of meters of, of overburden um, and it's become, it starts to become impractical to do a surface mining method. Would red water be available to the initial first humans on Mars? Would they be able to utilize that or would that come later? Do you know? Um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, no one's really put together a manifest for an actual planned mission. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I would imagine it will be ready. I mean, it, the prototype is essentially completed and tested and operation, operational. It's a honeybee-led project. Um, it, it's not not been fully closed out yet, but um, so you know this is NASA funded effort. So presumably it's a it, it will be made uh, you know all all the design and everything will be made publicly available. Um, and so I think this you know was a very viable technique. Um, it was um, the idea was to actually set up so you could do this basically robotically without the need for a human operator. Um, of course, having a human operator um, there may help, and maybe you can up, up, you know, increase the scale of this device to uh, access deeper ice, for example, um, if you bring humans along. Um, but yeah, I think the technology, you know, it's already being used here for resources at the South Pole on the on the Earth. Right? This is how they supply water to the uh, South Pole station. Um, and have for, I think, a couple of decades. Um, it's called a Rodriguez well. And um, it's 
you know, so it's a very well known understood technology. Um, and we now have a demonstration that it, it should work for Mars. Thank you so much. Students, are there any other questions? If you'd like to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself, just let me know. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate you and we really appreciate your participation and um, feel free to stay for Dr. Stoker's presentation as well. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Uh, okay. You're welcome. Oh, a student asked, can we take water? Yes, we can take water, but water's very heavy. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that's the idea is to try to live off the land so you don't have to bring all those resources with you. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, up next, we have Dr. Carol Stoker. She's a NASA scientist. <clears throat> and she will be speaking about life on Mars. Searching for life on Mars. Do you want to uh, share from your end? Yeah, let me ask you. Uh, sometimes I have problems uh, with PowerPoint in, in uh, uh, share screen mode, um, presentation mode, that it doesn't keep up with the... Um, you know, the, the slides don't advance very quickly or have okay. you even had that problem? I haven't, um, I haven't to this point, but if it doesn't work, I can load it on my end and I can go through the slides and see if that's better. So let's see if it works on your end. Okay, so um, what I think I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna do, well, let's try it. I, I also have it as a PDF. And that might work better. Okay. Let me try um, sharing my screen, sharing my PowerPoint. And I had one more question about water come in. What if we get water from the air on Mars, hydrogen and oxygen? There's very little oxygen in the Martian atmosphere. Um, you would have to separate the carbon dioxide. If if Mr. Putzig is still here and would like to chime in, that would be fine. I can see your slides, Carol. Okay. Um, so uh, I would like to um, talk to you uh, folks about uh, what is the science? What is the science you do when you're on the surface of Mars? <laughs> And uh, I would argue that the search for extant life on Mars is actually one of the very important science objectives of having people on Mars. Do you want to start your slides from the beginning? This is the beginning. Oh, oh mine, I, I just want to double check. Mine says location of all previous Mars landers. That's the one I can uh, Okay, so again, there's something wrong here. Okay, there, now I see the beginning. Now I see the beginning. Um, but now I'm not in presenter view. Um, um, go to slideshow and start from beginning. Yeah, that's what I did. Oh, okay. Um, Let's see what happens now. I see, so what first, saying? I see the first slide. It's just not in slideshow mode. It's it's not. Okay, <laughs> let's let's try the uh, let's try the PDF version. Okay. Um, because. Like I said, I've kind of had problems with this, with doing this in, um, and I don't really know why. <laughs> it seems to be a Zoom problem. Yeah, um, it's glitchy. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> I think you should be seeing my screen. We, uh, for now, we still okay. see the slideshow. Yeah, hang on. Um, okay. What I want to do is get out of uh, <clears throat> new share. How about that? Um, let's try that there one. There it is. Okay. Okay. And now I want to view this as um, full screen. Perfect. Looks great. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> all right. So once again, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk to you about 
the uh, search for life on Mars. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about the targets. Where do you, what are the interesting places to look for evidence of life? Um, but first of all, I'm going to go back to, uh, back to the past. Um, so maybe it comes as a surprise, but <clears throat> the only mission that's ever searched for evidence of extant life on Mars was two Viking landers that flew in 1976. I suspect for the people that are working on this project, their parents weren't even alive when, um, <clears throat> when this mission was performed. Um, it was the first ever successful landing on Mars. Um, there were two identical landers. One landed at <clears throat> a low latitude site and this, the second one landed at a relatively high latitude site. And uh, very uh, aggressively, they, this lander contained a life detection package. So there were three life detection instruments that searched for evidence of metabolism based on um, basically culturing microorganisms. There was also a fourth instrument <clears throat> that really wasn't part of the life detection package, but it just looked for the general presence of organic compounds on Mars. Um, okay, and now when I go to go to the next slide, <clears throat> okay, it's, all right. So the, here's the three Viking biology experiments. Um, <clears throat> all of them were culturing experiments, which um, was at the time, you know, the only thing, the only technique that we had for determining the presence of microbiology. I mean, even then it was understood we weren't going to find giraffes on Mars, but we would, if there was life on Mars, it would be um, single-celled microorganisms. And by the way, on the surface of the Earth, <clears throat> the only life on Earth for most of the history of life on Earth was single-celled microorganisms. Um, the Earth is about three and a half, there's life on Earth, is known to be life on Earth for about three and a half billion years, and for uh, three billion of those years, the only life on Earth was single-celled microorganisms. So um, the, uh, the way you do culturing is you take soil, or at least the way you do culturing of soil microbes, is you take samples of soil and you, um, you add nutrients to those samples of soil, and then you look for colonies of microbes to grow up. And that happens over a period of time. So that's what the Viking microbiology experiments were designed based on, is these sort of soil uh, culturing experiments. Um, <clears throat> they looked for evidence of respiration. So soil, if you uh, culture microbes, takes in gases and gives off gases. Um, <clears throat> so uh, generally speaking, it's carbon dioxide that's um, either taken in or given off. Um, and depending on the type of, of metabolism, it might be oxygen that's given off. So there are different um, experiments. We're looking at different gases uh, using labeled uh, carbon in the, uh, in the headspace gases. So what was found was that the soil was unexpectedly reactive. Um, and that the reactions were somewhat like earth life would produce. In other words, the soil seemed to be breathing. It would take in gases and give off gases, but it happened very, very rapidly compared to what would be expected in a soil culturing experiment on earth. Um, again, there were three independent experiments by three independent groups. And one of the three had results that the, um, uh, the set of the, the scientists who were responsible for that experiment believed were biologically um, produced. The other two behaved in somewhat similar ways, but when the soil was first heated up, so there was a control experiment where you first heated the soil up um, and then repeated the experiment, and two of the three experiments still gave similar results. The results were reduced, but they were similar. This, the soil still gave off the uh, reactive gases. The label release experiment did not. 
it was completely consistent for the way you would expect biology to behave in terms of uh, once it was heated up, the reactions went away. But this fourth experiment, which again was not part of the biology package, uh, was the organic analysis. And it showed there were no organics in the soil at levels of parts per billion. So this was so uh, <clears throat> devoid of organics that the, the logic uh, was that there really could not be biology in the soil because um, there would, biology leaves dead microorganisms and they show up as organic compounds. So the complete lack of organics in the soil was thought to, to really, really rule out that any of these results were a function of biology. It turns out that that result was a false negative. Uh, later missions showed that organics are present on Mars, but the Viking missed them. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit later. Um, <clears throat> but as a result of the Viking biology experiments, there was a kind of a strong consensus that built over time that there was no life on Mars at the present time. And it wasn't totally based on the, the results of the Viking biology experiments. It was more based on the, the sort of very um, difficult circumstances, difficult environmental conditions that life on Mars would have to um, persist in. But growing evidence, starting from the Viking uh, orbiter investigations and, uh, and then <clears throat> other subsequent uh, Mars missions back this up um, were that the uh, while the present conditions on Mars were not conducive to life, uh, early Mars was. And early Mars was very much like early Earth. <clears throat> um, so that missions after Viking have basically searched for evidence of past liquid water and potential signatures of past life. Um, and, and Again, going back to the, the period of time that Mars had running water, uh, lakes, possibly even a, a global ocean. <clears throat> um, and this was 3 billion years ago, on the order of the same time that life was starting on Earth. So basically, subsequent missions to Viking have been looking at that early period, the ancient period of life on Mars. And there are currently two NASA rovers that are operating, and they are both exploring ancient lake deposits, uh, looking for organic signatures of past life. And one of those missions, the Perseverance uh, rover, is collecting samples from uh, ancient rocks. And those samples are supposed to be returned to Earth in the early 2030s um, to look for some evidence that there is um, <clears throat> that can be identified as as signatures of past life. Now, I don't think that's going to be very easy, even when those samples come back, because searching for evidence of um, essentially fossil evidence of bacteria is very, very difficult, even if you have lots and lots of samples. But <clears throat> uh, we won't go into that more now. <laughs> um, so what is the, the main limitation for life on Mars now or in the past? It's really the presence of liquid water. Um, life as we know it requires um, <clears throat> liquid water basically as a solvent to allow nutrients to move in and out of cells. And cells, microbial cells, just like human bodies are mostly water. So, um, in order to be able to have life, stant life or ancient life, you need a source of liquid water. Um, and what this plot is, is this is a phase curve of water. And um, so basically phase curve meaning this is the, um, the relationship between the pressure um, and the temperature. And the, the uh, line here is the, uh, at, at a particular temperature, what is the vapor pressure of liquid water over a pure liquid surface? And this uh, uh, vertical arrow here is the pressure range that's experienced on Mars. So just from the pressure point of view, 
um, there's only a very small uh, range where pure liquid water on Mars can exist. Um, <clears throat> so in general, you think of on Mars, when you have pure liquid water, it's rapidly evaporating and it goes from, from solid to gas or from a very tiny amount of liquid to gas very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, but what we know is that when you add salt to that water, it actually can uh, lower that um, freezing point or the point at which you get this liquid phase to form at all. Um, so uh, it's known that thin films of liquid water can produce in mineral soils down to uh, minus 20 degrees centigrade, which is minus four Fahrenheit. Um, <clears throat> and that salts on Mars, particularly perchlorate salts, can form salty liquid water at very low temperatures, down to like minus 70 degrees centigrade. So um, that's gonna turn out to be pretty important for the search for extant life. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a workshop that identified four different potential habitable environments for life on Mars. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm gonna talk about those four different environments. And you can think about in your um, designs, how you might explore those kinds of environments um, to search for life. With humans on the surface, we have a lot of capabilities to search for life. So the four environments are ground ice, which you just um, heard all about, uh, salts and brines, which might actually be related to ground ice, uh, caves, and uh, there, given the fact that there's all this ground ice, there could also be deep, deep subsurface liquid water aquifers. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Than has given you a really good um, understanding of where is the ground ice. I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail, but, but basically all latitudes above 40 degrees north appear to have ground ice within about a meter of the surface. Um, and uh, so that actually implies that the good places to land for human landing sites are also gonna be in those uh, sort of high mid latitude uh, locations where the ground ice is located. Um, so, but the other thing that's really important to understand is that climate change on Mars happens really very rapidly and that um, it's caused by changes in the orbital parameters of Mars. Uh, at the current time, the obliquity of Mars, which is the tilt of the axis, uh, is 25 degrees. But five million years ago, there was a period where on average it was 35 degrees and it could be as high as 45 degrees. And this lower chart is actually showing uh, what the obliquity was going back in time. And what you can see is that these oscillations in obliquity are happening on very rapid time scales. So over you know, the last million years, the obliquity has been oscillating up to almost 35 degrees and down to almost 15 degrees on time scales of only a few uh, like 100,000 years. Um, so what happens when the obliquity increases is that the uh, ice moves around on Mars and it's moving around because the sunlight is falling on the surface. It's, sun, it's falling on the surface at different um, insulations as the obliquity varies. And on the right-hand side is the, uh, the summer solstice insulation value. Uh, and so at the current obliquity, the, um, the summer solstice insulation in terms of, of power, watts per meter squared, is a, a value of about 250. At this 35 degrees, which is the upper end of the insulation, again, just in the last million years, it's like um, 350. 
So it's a lot more energy uh, available. And so this is, this is actually um, a, high a plot of the high latitude. And the high latitude is like near the polar cap. So what that means is that the ice that's in the subsurface is actually unstable and it sublimates and it moves to a different latitude. And there are uh, modeling studies that show this. Um, before I show you the results of the mod modeling studies, I just want to show you uh, this plot that shows you where all the previous Mars landers have gone. Um, so some of them, which are grayed out, are ones that were unsuccessful. Um, so the successful ones include um, the uh, Opportunity and Curiosity rovers, um, Perseverance is not on here for some reason, but it's also uh, in a low latitude site. So most of the landers have gone to these low latitude sites. The exceptions are one of the Viking landers, which went pretty high uh, <clears throat> uh, latitude, it was 57 degrees, and the Phoenix lander, which was at 68. <clears throat> Phoenix was actually uh, <clears throat> above the Arctic Circle. <clears throat> Um, so this is, next thing here is a plot. This is a, a paper, came out in 2022. The authors are Mike Mellon and Hannah Sizemore. And this shows <clears throat> um, where the, the uh, a, a theoret theoretical model <clears throat> um, would show you the ground ice should be at different um, times going back in history. So going back the last two and a half million years, uh, and this is the ice table depth as a function of time at these different landing sites. So the Phoenix one, which is the highest latitude, the ice table depth stays pretty close to the same. Um, but if you go to these lower latitude sites, currently the ice table depth, this is the modern times, currently the ice table depth is um, essentially infinity, there is no ice table, but you go back in time and all these low latitude landers end up having ground ice right up almost to the surface. Um, so this is curiosity, perseverance, um, you know, basically what this means is that virtually all of the surface of Mars at some time has ground ice right next to the surface. This is important from the point of view of where modern life might still be hanging on because this is a short period of time compared to how long uh, microbes can survive essentially in a, um, uh, an inactive state in spores. <clears throat> so, um, the uh, the next target to look at is uh, is salts, or it's actually the first target to look at. Uh, salts are a, uh, a a type of environment that can actually pull water out of the atmosphere into the salt and uh, allow there to be a habitable environment. It's in a very tiny place, but it's nevertheless a habitable environment. Uh, and so regular old salt, table salt, fluoride salts um, on Mars have been identified on Mars in at least 640 places. Uh, this kind of salt, just um, <clears throat> sodium chloride salt in the Atacama Desert uh, can host growing endolithic cyanobacteria. Um, and they obtain water from atmospheric humidity at um, when the atmosphere is in saturation, it just pulls it into the salt, and then there are microbes that grow in that environment. Um, another uh, interesting fact is that viable microbial colonies can survive in salt crystals, uh, basically in little fluid inclusions that occur in the salt crystals for a uh, hundred million years. So um, much longer than the uh, change in obliquity actually allows 
water ice to move around on the surface of Mars. So for that reason, salts themselves, which really could be anywhere on Mars, uh, are an interesting environment to the search for life. Um, now, going back to the, the Phoenix lander story, this is a mission that landed at 68 North uh, on ice rich terrain in 2008. And uh, it was looking at um, basically the chemical environment of the surface. And it was actually searching for nitrates because nitri nitrogen and nitrates are very important for biology. Um, but what it found, and it was quite an accident, is it found that there is this uh, compound of uh, chlorine. The chlorine on Mars it tends to not be in sodium chloride, but rather this compound called perchlorate, which is a chlorine molecule four oxygen molecules, and it grabs on to about eight water molecules. So uh, why is perchlorate important? Well, first of all, it burns organic carbon. If you, if you take organic carbon and perchlorate together and heat it up, it combusts into carbon dioxide. And this is likely the explanation for why no organics were found on Mars by the Viking experiments. Uh, it likely burned in the heating stage of the instrument. The type of instrument that was uh, used on Viking first heats the soil to liberate uh, the organics and then analyzes the organics, but it actually probably uh, um, burned them to CO2. Uh, the second thing that's important about it is it's antifreeze. It can lower the freezing point of water to up to 90, minus 90 degrees centigrade which are typical temperatures found in the Mars polar regions today. And then the third reason is that it's very strongly deliquescent. Uh, perchlorate salt crystals can become water drops at 80% uh, relative humidity. And then once they actually become water drops, they don't want to give up that water. And as the humidity goes uh, back up, or back down rather, they remain liquid down to like 20% humidity. So um, okay, somehow my uh, slides are <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is a slide showing where on Mars this deliquescence, um, this last thing about uh, water being um, <clears throat> Uh, the, of perchlorate actually allowing uh, water, liquid water to form. Uh, and so this, these are plots of where on Mars this uh, deliquescence can occur, where it's allowed to occur. And this is a paper uh, that was in Nature Astronomy of 2020 uh, by Rivera Valentin. And uh, there's two plots here. One is the temperature uh, and the other is the water activity. So what this is showing is that there's these large areas of Mars where this uh, uh, liquid water can occur. And the water activity is a measure of how accessible that water is um, essentially to microbial growth. However, this occurs on current Mars. This is occurring if it occurs at all. We don't know for sure that it does, but it's predicted that it can occur. And, and when it does occur, it's occurring at night because that's when the relative humidity goes up high enough for deliquescence to occur. So it's occurring at very low temperatures, minus 65 to minus 75 degrees centigrade. So what we know about terrestrial biology um, is that the limits which terrestrial biology is known to grow is at a water activity no greater than 0.6 and a temperature no uh, less than point, uh, minus 25 degrees C. So this is way too cold for microbial growth, but it is not that the water activity is high enough for microbial growth. So we don't know. I mean, this is terrestrial bacteria. This is what we know on Earth. We don't know uh, whether that would actually um, be a habitable environment on Mars. 
it's um, it's uh, like we haven't done the experiments to even be able to find that out. Uh, okay, so uh, next site then would be caves. Um, caves are uh, <clears throat> important because they can actually be warmer and wetter than uh, the surface environment. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, there is a map, a, a set of maps um, that have shown that there are at least a thousand cave entrances that have been mapped on Mars. Uh, many of these are associated with lava, uh, Tharsis volcanism in particular. And uh, caves are important because they can provide a habitable environment, um, warmer and wetter and sheltered from ultraviolet and cosmic radiation. Um, the most of the mapping that has identified cave entrances is looking for basically just holes in the ground. And again, these are, are uh, associated with lava tubes and uh, <clears throat> volcanic areas. However, there also is evidence of what's called karst topography uh, in the ground ice rich areas. And there are several studies that have um, mapped evidence of cave formations in um, areas that are ice rich. And that is probably associated with the fact that, again, because of obliquity variations, the location of the ground ice uh, is moving around. And that means that the ground ice is sublimating and that actually allows caves to form because you get hollows, places in the ground where the um, subsurface ice has evaporated and leaving uh, a hole in the ground. Uh, so in fact, a very important um, uh, study that I think needs to be done is to actually find these cave entrances uh, in ice rich terrain. If anybody wants to work on that, that's a good problem to address. Um, so if you have caves and if they are inhabited, and, and these are examples on earth, uh, the uh, organisms actually, at least in the uh, rock, um, rocky caves, uh, actually can look a lot like mineral features. And you actually have to uh, scrape them off the walls and get them under a scanning electron microscope. And then when you do that, you can find really extraordinarily weird looking uh, features at the you know, micron scale, um, which are, are definitely uh, biological indicators because there's just no mineral forms that do that. Um, but getting into caves is actually, um, even to do the basic uh, evaluation of, is that a warm and wet environment uh, requires technologies that are um, different than any that have previously been demonstrated on Mars, with the exception of the new one, which is flown on the, on the uh, Perseverance rover as part of that payload. And you probably heard about this. It's called the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, and it uh, could fly over a cave entrance with just a very simple payload and determine whether, or even down into the cave entrance, and determine whether that is a habitable environment. <clears throat> uh, the other thing about caves is that they can be extremely um, <laughs> nonlinear environments. Um, the uh, the picture on the left is a is a lava tube, and in many cases, a lava tube cave will um, will be fairly um, uh, easy to explore on foot, like with astronauts, um, or even with rovers. And this actually shows a, a not very capable rover. <laughs> As you can see, there's, you know, basically just four wheels and a, a chassis uh, in a lava tube cave in Northern California, in a place called Lava Bebs National Monument. Um, so this, this cave is uh, just a tube. And so you could drive up this tube. It has a relatively flat floor. Um, so that is a, uh, 
a type of environment you might encounter in a cave, but here's another one on the right, a very different kind of environment. And these little tiny things here are actually people walking around on what turn out to be giant crystals, uh, like they're on the, in the inside of a, um, uh, a very um, pathological kind of terrain. Um, and this is this would be a very uh, difficult type of terrain to get any kind of a robotic system to explore. Um, may only be possible to do this with human explorers. <clears throat> okay, so then the final thing is deep subsurface water. There is um, there has been a set of papers uh, discussing a feature that's that's seen in the southern um, polar region of Mars uh, with radar, with the deep ground penetrating radar, uh, that shows what appears to be um, radar bright areas that were originally um, claimed to be evidence of deep subsurface liquid water. Um, and at depths of like one and a half kilometers depth. Uh, there's been a lot of pushback on this particular uh, observation, um, mainly based on the fact that the uh, temperatures that would be expected at these depths are still not high enough to support liquid water, even for chlorate rich brines. Um, so that is still kind of a work in progress, um, but if you were to try to go to a place that currently has liquid water in the deep subsurface, you need to drill. Um, so uh, there are now, um, there has, I mean, on earth, you know, drilling a, a kilometer and a half is, is done all the time. It's uh, very um, common that um, deep drilling to get oil out of the ground or natural gas out of the ground goes much deeper than that. But for uh, the kind of scale that is needed for human exploration, you really need a pretty lightweight um, drill. Even, even with the kinds of payloads that you can bring, you're gonna need a lightweight drill. Well, Honeybee Robotics has been building a, a wireline drill. It's actually been deployed drilling into Greenland ice it's gone 110 meters in a 2020 field campaign, and it's a pretty much a two-person lift and setup kind of uh, system. Um, so that, that, again, is the kind of uh, technology that can be deployed by a set of human crews um, and is, uh, is what we think uh, human crews might be doing. So I'm sorry, went the wrong way. I guess that's, that's um, the end of my formal presentation and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you so very much, Dr. Stoker. Um, of course, we appreciate you joining us again. So as the students add their questions to the chat, um, I will just ask some questions um, that came in earlier. Would you say that if we find life on Mars, it could negatively affect a human mission to Mars? Um, well, my own, my own view is that um, a precursor mission, at least one precursor mission to search for extant life on Mars at the location humans are likely to go uh, really needs to be done. And it needs to be done to protect Earth um, <clears throat> because humans are going to come back um, and they're going to bring Martian materials with them. Uh, and without any evidence, you know, a priori, because we have no evidence. I mean, we have this one mission that was flown in, you know, 1976. We have absolutely no attempt, even none of the missions that have followed on have even attempted to search for life on Mars. So the um, uh, we are taking a big risk, in my opinion, of sending humans to Mars without having better information on this topic in particular. 
Now, there is a mission that has been recommended by the most recent decadal survey. And um, <clears throat> so every 10 years, the uh, science community, the planetary science community and other science communities uh, get together and they make a recommendation um, of what is gonna be done in the next 10 years. What is their priorities? And so in this uh, last, the one that was in 2010 recommended Mars sample return, but the Perseverance mission that's collecting the samples is the first phase of that Mars sample return. But it's gonna take yet another mission to go pick up those samples and bring them back to earth. And furthermore, they're not in a nice rich region. They're not in a region that's at all likely to have modern life on Mars because there's just no water available there. Um, so they're not particularly relevant to the, the question of extant life, unless extant life is just easily identified in any old samples you might grab from anywhere. And I think that's very unlikely to be true because on average, the surface of Mars is extremely hostile to life. So we need, especially if we're going to a region that has high uh, potential for life, and I think the ice-rich regions are one of those areas, um, we should do due diligence and do a mission to search. And that actually was recognized in the most recent dec decadal survey, which was published in 2022. Um, and it recommended a mission to go to the ground ice and to do a life detection with the life detection payload. And this is called the Mars Life Explorer mission. The problem is that that mission is, um, first of all, was not in the budget and most of the budget is being eaten up by this sample return mission that is already gone through the first decade and is now you know, spilling over into the second decade. Uh, so we probably won't have those samples back until the mid 2030s. And even when we get them back, they're not relevant samples. So uh, will there even be funding for this Mars Life Explorer? Currently there isn't. So that's, that's sort of what the problem is. So on that subject, what is your scientific professional opinion of the difference between a Mars sample return mission and meteorites that fall to Earth naturally from Mars? Is there a difference in, um, you know, can a Mars sample return mission be contaminated? Is, are they going to accept the results from those samples if we get them um, safely? back to Earth? Well, again, I, I actually think um, the Mars Life Explorer mission is not a sample return. It's a in-situ analysis. And I think with an in-situ analysis, we can have some in better indication than we have now of is there extant life in, in the environment that the humans are likely to interact with. Um, the sample return was not designed in any way to give any information about extant life. It was designed to look for evidence of this ancient, putative ancient life that developed in the, in the early warm wet, what we call the warm wet period of Mars history. Um, it's um, uh, the, the counter argument to, do we need to worry about life on Mars contaminating Earth? is that meteors from Mars are found on Earth. And there's an, an exchange of material between Earth and Mars. Wouldn't that exchange of material um, <clears throat> solve the problem? We're already getting all kinds of material from Mars. It's just landing naturally. Um, maybe. I mean, the thing is that uh, the material that actually gets knocked off in a, uh, in a big enough impactor to, to manage to make it to Earth is not, is not uh, well treated in terms of you know, uh, the survival of life. For one thing, it's, it's a huge explosion. It's extremely high temperatures in the explosion. Um, it spends a lot of time in transit between Earth and Mars. It gets very well cooked by radiation during those, those periods of, of millions of years. Um, and uh, 
And we see many, many examples on Earth where you bring in something from a environment that's, you know, essentially next door. I mean, COVID, for example, apparently jumped species between bats and, and you know, uh, raccoon foxes and various different animals into the human population and suddenly we've got a global pandemic. It's, um, it's an issue of how much risk are we willing to take? And in my view, we have done, not done due diligence by just assuming that it's gonna be okay to send humans to Mars without any further information about extant life. That's my professional opinion. Okay, thank you. And if we did find extant life on Mars with a human mission, would we recognize it if it had, um, if it didn't have the type of DNA we have? Do we have the capability to recognize that if it's different? Um, yes, the answer is yes, um, by lots of different means. If you got it, if you got a, a human um, set up with a a normal microbiology lab and, and standard instrumentation that would be in a, in a microbiology lab, uh, you could identify microorganisms with, with uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are other potential um, compounds like DNA, but they aren't DNA. They have you know, different uh, chemical structure, but they have the same, um, capability to repeat themselves. Um, and that is basically what DNA allows is, you know, uh, replication. Um, that, that can be detected chemically. So it, it's not, um, I mean, the, it's so much easier if you've got uh, a lab technician and a set of instrumentation to identify what's going on, then it, you can do it by by sending an instrument that you can automate. Um, the sensitivity of those uh, automated instruments is just enormously less. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the ability to actually change your experiment based on the results that you get. You don't have that with anything that you have pre-programmed and sent to the surface of Mars as a, a robotic system. So yeah, it's just much, much better. And lastly, what would a human mission to Mars need in their lab to look for life? Like in the lab, what types of things would they need to bring? Uh, well, I think that there are um, lists of instruments. I mean, I, I can't really tell you off the top of my head. I'm actually not a microbiologist. <laughs> but a good start would be a scanning electron microscope and a regular microscope, an optical microscope. Um, a, uh, a PCR machine, which is, you know, allows you to amplify um, DNA. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, you know, there's a huge list of uh, the types of instruments that are um, used in, um, in microbiology research. And, um, and they, um, they can easily fit in a, a starship based <laughs> um, landing site or landing payload. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoker. Does anybody else have questions while we're on here and we have this wonderful scientist at our disposal? While we're waiting, um, students, I have uploaded the first day's recording to the syllabus. All of the other ones, please allow 24 to 48 hours for those to be uploaded and attached to the syllabus. Also, make sure you fill in the spreadsheet for your time zone. So I'm going to try to group everyone up in their teams by the end of the week to give you guys extra time um, to start your project. So please make sure you put your time zones in there so I group you appropriately. Dr. Stoker, I don't see any other questions. Again, uh, as always, we appreciate your participation and your time. And um, I look forward to you seeing all the results of this wonderful project. Okay, nice to, nice to talk to you guys.
Okay. If anybody has uh, a reason to reach out, you got my email address. Yes. And I will try to answer questions that way. Okay, thank you everyone. I will see you in two hours for the next talk. Thank you. People are all saying thank you, Dr. Shoker. You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right, bye.